Victor, when I think about the first quarter of 2023, the one word that pops in my head immediately is volatility. Um, we saw the two-year, for example, sell off 80 basis points from the start of the year into early September. We then saw the two-year rally almost 130 basis points to its current level. Uh, we've seen the market price in a Fed pivot. We've seen our market trade as tight as 120 on the index to as wide as 160. But still, our market was able to digest over 400 billion in supply, um, which is a very healthy calendar given some of the macro issues we had to deal with. So if I had to ask you, given this ever-changing macro landscape are we deal that we're dealing with, how are investors thinking about the asset class? How are investors thinking about the market right now? Well, I mean, Moshe, I think really when you think about absorbing the kind of supply that we absorbed, you really have to go back to technicals that started in the latter half of 2022. When we hit those index highs in October and November, there was a rush by a lot of people and it was the fourth high that we'd hit for the year. I think there was a lot of rush from accounts to get in on what they thought were very attractive spreads at that time. But what was happening during the course of the year was supply was actually dwindling. If you think about the course of the year last year, we were down net 29% supply. That was led by down a net 55% supply in corporates. And that didn't get better at the year. It actually exacerbated. Our December was one of the lowest Decembers on record. I think second lowest December on record. In fact, it ran at one-fifth of what the five-year average was for December. I think it was like $8.3 billion. So you came into January. I think that's what this was about. We came into January with a really strong technical spreads. It already started tightening in the month of December. And we also came up with the expectation that it's tough to repeat two negative years in the fixed income market on returns. And so there was a lot of optimism, I think, coming in in January. And that's when you saw index spreads get down to the 120 place. What I think was really important was we hit SVB. Now, spreads were starting to, to widen just before the Silicon Valley bank crisis. But we took a pause, but I say it's a pause because a lot of people said the market was closed. I don't think the market was closed. I think it was just trying to find its the right entry level for both issuers and investors. And if you look at what happened in the two weeks after what we closed March on, it was probably some of the most impressive two weeks of the quarter so far. We had oversubscriptions higher for both weeks on average than they had been for the entire year. We saw new issue premiums tighter than the way they'd been for the average. And we saw the ability of Seneca Desk to move pricing from beginning to end up five, 10 basis points. We were able to move them greater than we had been for the entire quarter. So when I think about it, it really was the technical underpinning of supply and demand that was leading people to this. And in the first quarter, we exacerbated it again. We were down a net 21, 24%, I think, in net supply for the first quarter of 2023. So you can't find enough credit just when people are looking for the asset class. Those are impressive technicals. And the thing that stood out to me from a supply perspective is when I look at 2022, heavily do not dominated by financials with corporates participating, but in a much lower, lesser extent than what we've seen in the past. That is completely flipped this year. Well, if you think about it, what happened, it started last year was as the market got more difficult, it spreads widened and the Fed became more opaque for people. They started trying to hide out the term loans. We saw a big uptick in the term loan uh, requests and issuance at that time. They also found that their cost of funding in the front end started to get very, very expensive, especially when the curve inverted. You got to a standpoint where tier one, tier two, tier three CP had not only shortened, shortened dramatically during the Silicon Valley bank crisis. It's gotten a little better since then. But all that shortened and it got significantly more expensive, hundreds of basis points more expensive. And I think issuers, and you know there's some of your issuers, started looking for other options in order to fund their short-term liabilities rather than just sitting in CP and pounding it out. You know, and you had a couple of issuers, I think, who did just that. Yeah, that's right. I mean, we've seen, obviously, a pickup in callable monetization transactions to try to get a cost-effective CP surrogate. We've even seen investment-grade companies go to the convertible bond market to term out CP. I don't know if I've ever seen that in my career, but it, it, it really focuses on the main issue that I'm hearing from corporate treasurers is managing interest expense. Many of our clients are dealing with declining margins. And it, an increased interest expense is a double whammy for the P&L. So as a result, I'm seeing a lot of my clients start to push the envelope, look at structural alternatives, and make sure that they don't have that big jump up in interest expense as likely going to happen um, just based off of the current backdrop. So what are they doing? They're doing three NC1 structures. Uh, for example, the billion and 750 we did for AT&T or the billion and a half we did for Warner Brothers. They're also looking at the convertible bond market. Um, we led a transaction for Southern companies earlier this year where the use of proceeds was to pay down commercial paper. So they're really looking under every corner to see if they can reduce, if there's a way to reduce interest expense even further. 
Yeah, look, it's not, I don't think it's going to change much in the future, right? We've come off, as we said, we've come off a pretty strong March. Uh, and we're set up here to start April in the second quarter in pretty good fashion in the new issue market, right? A lot of demand for the product, good oversubscription, but we do have a lot of headwinds coming our way. We got earnings season upon us. We've got a lot of data in the first part of April. We're going to have, uh, what well, we got an employment number. We're going to have CPI and PPI hit us again. We're going to have at the beginning of May, we're going to have the next Fed meeting. So April could be a very volatile month. The only thing I think that's in our favor in April right now is that this trend for lower supply numbers is going to continue, right? Because a lot of companies start going into blackout. I think that's one of the important things. So April looks like, uh, from a technical perspective, we'll be in pretty good shape uh, heading into the new issue calendar. But there's a lot of, uh, you know, you may call them minefields that can, can really kick up on this volatility theme you've been talking about for the last three months. I'll tell you what I really like. I like the fact that the yield on the index, not the spread on the index, has actually declined 40 basis points so far this year. You don't see that if investors think there's a hard landing. You see that cost of funding go up. So as long as investors have that glasses half full mentality, we should be okay. But as you said, there's a lot of minefields out there that we have to navigate in order to make sure that what we're seeing right now some sustainability to it. Yeah, I mean, look, uh, the market right now, I mean, we think about where 10-year Treasury is right now. The market's pricing in three, four rate cuts for the back end of the year, the beginning of 2024. Uh, whether those happen or not, it's going to be very interesting because we could trade in a pretty large band around, uh, around treasury rates. So your theme of volatility for the last three months is probably going to continue for the next three months. And I'd love to sit here and ask you where, uh, where you think the 10-year treasury is going to be, but I'm not sure that's a fair question. Totally not a fair question because my answer is going to be a 100 basis point range. But look, at this point, what else would you suggest for, for clients? I mean, to me, we've seen an uptick in hedging as we've seen treasury rates drop. We've seen people taking advantage when the market is open of financing, even financing needs that are in the second half of the year. As in some cases, they've found they've been able to find places where they can lower their cost of carry in, in the cash markets, given the high rates in the front end. What else, what are some of the other themes you would think about that people should consider heading into the next quarter? I think when people look at their funding needs over the next 12 months, they need to factor in that we're dealing with an environment where market isn't necessarily reflecting the risks of the macro. In that situation, you're supposed to take advantage of that and give yourself an extra insurance policy in terms of incremental liquidity needs as we navigate our way through these uncharted waters. That might be the first time you and I actually agree completely on something. Oh, so. my God. Well, I look forward to sitting down with you next time. Thank you very much. Same here, Marshall.